Hustle podcast, hosted by Chris Kiblin. Real hustle, real people, real results. So how are you? Excellent. Well, thank, thank you. you for coming. <laughs> thank you for having me <laughs> on, Chris. Right. I'm excited to be here. So it's kind of funny how we met. Um, mm-hmm. So you reached out to me about wanting to do a podcast, <laughs> and then I find out what you do, and I'm like, wait a minute, I need to have you on my podcast. <laughs> I know. It was kind of a blessing in disguise. <laughs> right? I was just like, because the stuff that you do and the stuff that I've watched is just truly amazing. I mean, you have a special gift. Thank you. And, um, you know, and it's like, I don't know, I get, I sit there and I I watch what you do and I'm just sitting there and I'm just wowed, Um, you know, and I started sitting there and I was like, after, you know, I started looking at your Instagram page and (laughs) all your videos and that kind of thing. So tell us what you do because it's pretty exciting. Thank you so much for that, (laughs) uh, for that beautiful introduction, first of all. And um, I'm a sports artist, but an artist by trade, really. A lot of the work that I do is two-dimensional, so that's painting on different surfaces, I'll say, not, or, well, maybe we'll say three-dimensional, because I'm usually paint, I can also paint on three-dimensional surfaces, okay. such as chairs and baseball bats and and jerseys and stuff like that. But um, I also do large-scale murals, uh, live painting for different charity events, high-profile sports events, and private events as well, but, uh, the majority of the work that I do in my studio is working with sports equipment to physically create the art. So I'm trying to bring a level of authenticity to my work by using the equipment of the game to create the athletes of the game. And that's what that, I typically that, go that, for. And that's what I'm in, like in love with your work with. <laughs> okay. I'll just put it out there. Um, <laughs> because now explain that, because how did you come up with that? Like, give us a, a, a you know, well, first tell us how you came up with it and then kind of explain to us how you use a football or a hockey puck or sure. something like that. Yeah, sure. So it was kind of funny. It was 2015. I was hired to paint, um, in Madison square garden up in New York. Uh, during World Tennis Day, it was for the USTA Foundation. They host an annual event in the garden every year where they bring on top athletes, tennis players, to uh, to face off in a match. It's an exhibition match, so it doesn't count towards their tour at all. And it's just for the fans to celebrate the love of the game, right. to put on a show, and then also to raise money for the USTA Foundation. So I was painting courtside a uh, while Roger Federer, Grigor Dimitrov, Monica Salas, and Gabriela Sabatini were all playing in their exhibition matches. And my heart was racing because I was a huge Federer fan. I was like, this guy is the goat. It doesn't get better than this. (laughs) And then I was an enormous Monica Salas fan growing up because I was a that was one of my first sports that I got into playing. And she was one of my idols. So um, just so you know, we're a huge tennis family. I don't know if you know know that. Well my son is a tennis pro. Get out. Yeah, oh, my so. God. So much more to talk about. <laughs> right, That's exactly. fabulous. So uh, the whole objective of that, of my painting there, was to create a piece from start to finish in roughly an hour and a half to two hours, which it captured the four athletes, a variety of logos, and the inside of the garden with the fans and everything. And it was a huge feat for me because normally I... I'm not a speed painter. I typically can spend from one week to three weeks on a painting. And I was not going to let this opportunity go. I was like, I'm going to figure it out. (laughs) So I, um, I, I came up with a layout that I was pretty excited about. I had an idea of what I was going to do in advance, but when it came down to the wire and all the cameras were on you and you have the fans all around, I was like, oh my goodness, I still have roughly 15% of this painting to go and only minutes left to do it. And I grabbed tennis balls out of my bag, dipped them in paint, and just started going to town on the painting. Oh, wow. (laughs) And I just fell in love with with what was happening before my eyes. It was like magic. And then I could hear the fan saying, get out of here. She's using a tennis ball (laughs) to create the painting. So I was kind of taking that into (laughs) account. And I was like, yeah, get out of here. I'm creating a painting with tennis balls. So it was an amazement to me at the same time. But, um, (laughs) but I really was just enjoying it so much. And by the end of that event, like, you know, they, the athletes came over 
for photo op, signed the painting. It went up in auction. It sold for like for around fifteen, twelve thousand dollars, something like that. Wow. And then, but the most exciting part was not only meeting these incredible athletes and how humble they were, but really what I had tapped into there. I was, I couldn't wait to get back into the studio and just experiment with what I had gotten started doing and taking it into different sports as well so what that was how that? it was born 2015 oh wow because yeah. like you know some of the stuff that i've seen you've done and so so obviously you must have been a fairly accomplished painter before you started there right because i mean to be called in to do something like that so tell us give us the beginning story then because sure. so, so, then let's go back a little bit absolutely i mean there were definitely some serendipitous moments throughout my career without a doubt but i would say it was like I was around 15 years old when I knew I wanted to try to become a sports artist. I had been introduced to a couple of other artists that I'd seen making a career. I'd seen make a career out of it and had seen firsthand what they do at events, whether it was, you know, painting live or just using their work to benefit, you know, various sports events. And right. I said, I didn't even know this was really an opportunity for me. And I had not, and then I ended up getting an opportunity to create um, a piece for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum when I was 18 years old. I was just graduating high school. That those it was two paintings on the face on the seats of two chairs, and it was a little bit of a controversial piece. It was about segrega segregation, actually. It had Jackie Robinson on one chair, sliding into home plate against Yogi Berra. Although I took out the umpire because I didn't want. <laughs> it to be necessarily yeah. about the right. call in right. that moment because right. it's a famous image. And then the other chair, uh, I had Ty Cobb in a very similar action sliding pose. On the back of that chair, I had written whites. And then on the back of the Jackie Robinson chair, I wrote colored. I was only, you know, 18 at the time. It was a really bold piece to be creating yeah. right in high school. I mean, I don't even know if I would have had the balls to do it right now, honestly. <laughs> right. It's like, no, no. Things, truthfully, because, yeah. you know, you... For me, though, I was reading about the history of the game and with, you know, not only the, the innocence and the awareness and the way you question society when you're really young is different, not really different, but it's a fresh perspective, you know, mm -hmm. and there's also sort of an innocence to it. Like oh, yeah. you're you're calling this out like there. The title of the piece was called The Same Game, and it was really just about the athletes in two similar sliding positions playing during segregation and like a segregated time and you had Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier so I had a uh, colored um, lace winter woven between the it was actually like leather from uh, from a baseball mitt interwoven okay. around the back of the chair so it kind of looked like a baseball mitt okay, and then black cool. and white on the whites so it was received extremely well in their exhibition and selected to be a part of a traveling exhibition, which went around the country with a selection of works wow. titled Shades of Greatness. And it's actually on its 20th year traveling now. Really? So it's like it's an exhibition that can be acquired or rented from on behalf of the museum to help raise money for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. But that experience really, really sparked in me the desire to want to pursue this. And then I ended up getting called by the New York Yankees when I was just 18 on my way to college. Um, well, I was actually commuting on the train into Manhattan and living at my parents' house at the time. <laughs> and I thought I was being prank called. <laughs> they said, is this Courtney Wall? Is this, this is Mike Bonner with the New York Yankees. Would you like to come in for an interview? I saw some of your work. And I thought, I honestly thought it was a family friend pranking me. So I was like, <laughs> very funny, Jeff. I was like, I was like, <laughs> I was like, I know it's you. And he was like, oh, no, this is Mike Bonner with the New York Yankees. And oh, I, wow. I was like, oh yes, when would you like me to come in? I'll be like, I was so excited. And, um, I, from there, they hired me to paint the starting lineup of the New York Yankees that was going to go up on the Jumbotron as each player was coming to bat. So they were basically going to flash a JPEG of the painting that I had created, and then the stats would drop down of that player, Derek Jeter, Jorge Posada, like, um, you know, right. as they're facing off the away team. So it was only during home games, but I realized after actually the second project they gave me too that I kind of wanted to do more in the line of charity work. And that is what sort of brought me into 
a lot of the live painting that I did and relationships with different athletes that should you get to meet these athletes too yes yeah and it's it's great I mean it's great (sighs) to learn their personalities off the field and also I a lot of what I do is through their charity events so it's always in goodwill and you know a lot of times there's just you know fun being had and and a great cause at hand so it's they're always very gracious to have you there and that's one of the reasons I love what I do because you're also making an impact as well for their cause yeah that's pretty I mean that's what I was wondering I was like because you know I mean I'm assuming I mean these people have seen your work right because I mean I I'm just wowed by it and you know and so it's like you know you know you know like I seen like you did like Derek Jeter and mm-hmm. um who, he, there was some. There was a lightning player. I can't remember who you did just, that I saw on your um, Instagram page, but I don't remember who it was uh, for Tampa Bay Lightning. Oh yes. Um, oh God, I'm just drawing a blank right now. What? <laughs> <laughs> which one did I do? <laughs> I know which one did I do. No, that was um. Okay, wait, hold on a second. Oh my God, Ugh, killing me. It's the goalie. <laughs> oh shit. Um, Big cat. He's yeah. calling. Why what is, is this like <laughs> starts? I know it's well. His name's so hard to say. It's, yeah, he's not one I've actually worked with necessarily. We just got the painting signed okay, through God. him, though. But uh, he was very nice. Sur- I can't remember his name. I know you're talking about. <laughs> and, uh, I should know. I went to. I was actually there when they won the championship. I oh, actually, wow. was at, I was actually at that game. I'm dying to go to their stadium. I mean, to that arena. Yes. That is amazing. I hear it's such an experience. It's great. It's great. Um, I'm not even. I wasn't even a hockey fan until. I mean, I watched hockey a little bit when I was because I'm from Baltimore. Oh, okay. And so we 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 didn't really have hockey. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had the Capitals, um, so we go see a game every once in a while. I wasn't a hockey fan until I moved here and started going to the Lightning games. Yeah. And once I got into the Lightning games and seeing and experiencing that, mm-hmm. it's a whole new world. And so, like, it, I really enjoyed it. And then we went and we actually went. There was I think it was Game Six, uh, the Stanley Cup Finals, and the game that they won at home. Mm-hmm. And I was there, and that was a cool experience. To see that yeah. was a major experience. And I still bummed, and I should have went, is when um, the Bucks won the Super Bowl. <gasps> I had yes. a chance to go, go and I said no, because I'm, I'm, I'm a Ravens fan. Yeah, okay. And, and I'm like, dude, I'm Baltimore. I was like, you know, why, why, <laughs> why do I want to go see Tampa play? <laughs> I was like, this not, my team's not in it. That's and so then funny. now I'm kicking myself. I was like, is to see the first team ever win and they, um, you know, when they're Super Bowl in their home stadium, yeah. and it was Tom Brady. So exciting. And I was like, why didn't I go? I was like, I should have just went. Now oh. I'm kick myself for it. And, and my wife yells at me all the time for it. You know, though, it was a great game to watch on TV, too. Yeah, it was. Whether you were there or not, that was a great Super Bowl. <laughs> right. So, Are you an Orioles fan, too? Not as much because, I hate to say it, but once the new owner took over, I kind of lost respect. Okay. I'm actually probably more, I was more of a Yankees fan two also growing up Mm -hmm. uh, my first game I ever went to was Yankee Stadium really Um, so well I have family lives upstate New York okay what part um, Highland Falls okay so in West Point oh yeah and so and so we used to go ever I went there every summer Mm -hmm. Um, my aunt lived up there and um, we were there I was there for months and and so we would take the train down Mm -hmm. into the city and we go watch the game and um, I remember this is how different the world is now. Um, one of my f- games that I went there, it was Bat Day. Mm-hmm. Not a little mini bat. It was a full on size bat. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. It wow. was, that's how things have changed. <laughs> you were very lucky. Uh, so that's I don't a even, great game to go to. Uh, so I don't, <laughs> I'm surprised I'm, they gave bats like that to the full, fans. <laughs> full, that's what I mean, <laughs> right? <they> get rowdy. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so it was a full size bat. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was. I don't know what happened to the bat, but I just remember that experience. Yeah. Um, but like they, my they were huge Yankees fans, and so I went to like really uh, probably more Yankee games. Mm-hmm. I was an Oriole fan because of Cal Ripken. Yes. Um, Eddie Murray um, and some of those guys. Yeah, I met Eddie Murray. He yeah, he's it. awesome. He's well, that was part of my issue when they mm-hmm. got rid of Eddie Murray. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's when I kind of lost respect for them. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how do you let him go? Ah. And so that's when we kind of lost respect. I mean, I've gone since then, um, you know, because now spring training's right here. 
I know. That's what they're else. to, right? It's yeah, our so, backyard. Yeah, so, yeah. So now I, we go to some of their games, too, for spring training. That's cool. Um, you know, and see some of that stuff. So, like, and that was kind of also the other thing that, it, like, with what you do, because mm-hmm. I'm a huge sports person, um, you know, and, you know, especially with football and, and that kind of thing. And, like, that's what I was wondering, how you got into this. So let's let's kind sure. of show them a video of some of your work, and, okay. and then that way they can experience it. Absolutely. So here you are. What this is with the baseball bat? And yes, then, so I this don't... is using a baseball bat. So I'll typically take the bat and create an abstract background that is pretty energetic. And then that's a tennis ball. That's actually I mean, it's a baseball. Right? Yes, and I cut my baseballs in half so I have a flat surface and then the seamed surface to work with as well. So just pause that there. So. <laughs> All right, so you used on this so that way people can see as we talk through this. Mm-hmm. So you used a baseball bat first, right? Baseball bat first, yep. And then the baseball I used to blend often, okay. like some areas can get a little bit chunky with the bat rolling the paint. So I'll use it both to blend or to create an effect like that I'm going for, which could be really anything, depending on how you use that ball. And then... I have drips going on in that painting, paint splatter. I just try to create something that I think is going to be completely original, but also sort of complements yeah, the is. athlete. So there's the ball part right there. So yeah, it's um, everything is time yeah, yeah. lapse, so it's a little fast. When but yeah, so I mean that's the thing is like so you know to use that, and then I guess the the, the question also is. The process. So now, when you use the bat, do you have to? Okay, so you gotta let it sit and dry for like so many days before you go back on it, or typically, luck. I mean, I use acrylic paint, especially for the background, so that can dry pretty fast, sometimes in hours. But okay. I like to let it dry overnight because sometimes I will apply the paint in a thick fashion, so that it um, just based on either what the equipment it does itself when applying the paint, and if I if I like what I see is happening before my eyes, then I'll just kind of let it dry and then work with it the next day. And that's honestly the beauty of working with sports equipment that I've found is that you kind of have to let go and let the medium dictate what it does. You're using your hands to maneuver it, but there isn't really a formula that's going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. So you get to... And each one of them, and which is kind of cool too, is each one is unique, right? Because yes. mean, it's going to come, come up with a different pattern. Yeah, there's no way... Exactly. I mean, whether that's working with a different color pat, palette and two different bats, I mean, you're going to have a totally <laughs> different painting. And then when it comes to working with different pieces of equipment from hockey to a baseball bat to footballs, the look is so different. So... They all have their own challenges, and then they all have their own, like, beautiful little discoveries that take place as well. So are you the only person in the world that does this? I have no idea. I think <laughs> I've seen – somebody sent me a video the other day of a girl using a football to sketch out a person, and that was, like, speed painting. So mm-hmm. I guess she was doing it time-lapse, too. So it had to have been done over the course of, I'm going to guess, X number of hours. But it's definitely different than this. I don't – I haven't seen anybody doing this, but – you know, one of the things you do when, when you're an artist, you sometimes just try to block out what other people are doing, <laughs> and you just do your own thing anyways and see where it takes you. Because, know, you. it's a copycat stuff, and people say, oh, let me try that. Oh, yeah, you get people, you know, and that's an, an interesting thing, too. I don't always necessarily teach what I do. It's not, um, that's not necessarily in my, we- I don't know if it's in my wheelhouse. I could, probably, but I'm still exploring it myself and right. loving it. And, yeah. <laughs> So, all right, let's go ahead and, and keep watching. This is Derek Jeter, right, that you're doing? And this one is Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge, okay. Aaron, the guy that just hit all those home runs, right? He just broke Maris's record, yep. 62 home runs last year against the Texas Rangers. This is final, or the, in the final home run there. So it was a really exciting race to watch. S- and so what was this particular piece? Was that for him or was that for no, charity? This was, so or? one of my partners is Fanatics and I work with Fanatics Authentic. So they uh, will, you know, will collaborate on different projects that we're doing. They have incredible access to players and having athletes sign the work right. or memorabilia. So 
uh, they wanted me to do an Iron Judge piece right around the time when, or you know, ready for when he He's broke that record. record right. And it was exciting yeah. to watch those games and follow the race and also be creating this piece knowing that. Are you from New York or? New Jersey originally. New Jersey. Okay, gotcha. I went to Man- I went to school in New York, but um, but yeah, I was a Jersey girl growing up. Okay. Were you a Yankee fan? I was a big Yankee fan. My <laughs> My family, oh, I grew up in a family of Yankee fans. My father especially was a huge Yankee fan, brought me to the stadium when I was, I guess, what do you say, two years old, I think. Okay. I mean, yeah. I didn't even know what was going on, but <laughs> but he was the season ticket holder. So we, you know, and the energy of the old stadium, as yep. you remember, yep. Yep. was just like yeah, so it's, wonderful. Yeah. It's irreplaceable. And fans got to know who sat all around them. Like they became your friends and... It was it was just such a great experience. In addition to the so, how did you get hooked up with Fanatics? Uh, during twenty twenty, I was because that, that's where you, everybody gets all their gear, right? Yes, so if you want anything yes. from the like, sportsman, like, I learned yeah. that they were uh, creating a fine art de- or what I thought was a fine art department, but it was called Fanatics Authentic, and okay. um, I started just messaging anyone I could find on LinkedIn who worked in Fanatics and was telling them about what I was doing. I maybe sent out like. 50 messages or so, or maybe somewhere around there. And somebody linked me up to the head of that division, and we set up a call. They, He liked my work a lot, and we just kind of got to it from there. So, so how many paintings have you done for them? Oh, um, well, I do originals and I do limited editions for them. So okay. I guess originals, I'm going to say right at this point from 20, midway through 2020 to now, maybe like, 20 roughly okay. originals and then limited editions we have a really large order of limited editions so for certain pieces um for certain let's see how many like for certain pieces like the otani i think we did 2021 limited editions of those and then so do they do, do they mass produce them or do they nothing they, is mass produced well, actually okay. yeah everything is pretty much an edition of at least four um which are hand embellished, so I'll go back into a print and repaint over it, touch it up, spend a number of hours really trying to like give it the feel of an original, okay. and then the athlete will sign that and will sign each of those usually, okay. and and then um, we also have editions that are just lightly embellished, so maybe those could be in an edition of like twenty one to like fifty roughly, let's say. So those are those are pretty much our edition sizes they could be anything but normally they're relative to like a significant number that has to do with the player oh wow i'm gonna finish it up this is so cool thank you (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome you just probably sell the bat (laughs) exactly i've had people ask me about that they said some i think i've got a couple messages saying can i just have the bat like thinking i would just give it away i was like (laughs) <laughs> actually no because <laughs> I don't really mind having a collection of the painted ones right. I was like I'll I'll hold on to them or sell them right but, yeah, yeah. I mean because that's the thing is like this was the bat that created that that you exactly. know or something or this is the whatever exactly the, the football I mean you know and and then even that could probably potentially sell so can mm-hmm. I ask um, what do they normally sell for Oh, it's a rate. Well, let's see. Those are normally 36 by 48. They are selling between like 9,500 and around 15,000 for an original 36 by 48. I charge according to square. Well, I have, my prices are per square inch. Okay. So they go down in size or up in size according to the size of the canvas. I mean, in price according to the size of the canvas. So That's kind of amazing. I mean, to think that your (laughs) artwork's selling for that much, you know, for one piece. Thank you. And do you, I'm assuming charity, they probably go even more if you're selling them, you know, people. Oh, absolutely. They can. They can go. It it can be hit or miss, though, I'll tell you that. Okay. Sometimes, you know, it depends on the charity and the audience. Like, they can go for a couple thousand dollars or they can go way up, like over 15. But you really got to have the right, Mix, the yeah, right, right audience bonus, there. Right. Yeah. Yes. Like that's, and that's one of the important parts of live painting is really knowing, you know, you know, the charity has to know that they have the art collectors and the people that will spend the money on that. And also creating a piece that is going to be specific to their audience or specific to that event. So that way, right. You know, 
the guests of the charity or the attendees will say, I was here, I watched it being created. This was really special. You're not going to, I'm not going to find a piece like this this anywhere anywhere else. else, Yeah. And have, you know, the impulse to want to bid on it. So, or the desire to. Do the, like the Bucks or some other sports team, do they just call you up and say, hey, we want to do a charity and, you know, will you come paint for us? In some cases, but I do a lot of my own outreach most of the time. I mean, and I, I'm really fortunate to have great relationships that I've and friendships over the years that I've developed who help will bring me back to their events or give me a recommendation or, you know, word of mouth also, you know, share what I do with other with other organizations. So you still gotta get out there and hustle and and bring and go after the business. It's a hundred (laughs) percent hustle. And there were years when I wanted to give up and thought this was never gonna work out. And then I would even if I had a great moment of success or like a highlight and then some crickets in between, I realized I gotta hit the ground and hustle for this. And whether it's I mean, that's the interesting thing too about having your own business and so many people can relate no matter what the industry is like you wear all the hats yep. you're your marketing team you're your PR <laughs> you're you know your customer service and you're, you're all of it the physical creator yeah so you have to be able to withstand the highs and the lows and you know take the highs in stride let that motivate the heck out of you and you know when that's what I find when I have Success and rejection hit me the same way. If I have a no from something that I really wanted or just or a no in general, I want it gives me the impulse to want to put together 10 more proposals to get out there mm-hmm. and let the wheels turn again, not let that get me down. And then when I have success, it hits me the same way. It makes me want to it makes it gives me that extra oomph to say, okay, re- let's right. reach for bigger. Let's do something else that scares me because it was crazy because, like, it. I sit here and I watch you, and and I would have totally would have thought that they were just trying knocking down your door, trying to get to you because it's such a unique thing, especially if you're doing it for charity or some kind of special event. You know what I mean? Because yeah. the thing is, is like I've gone to shows where you had the live artists. You know, they're they're doing a live painting there, right? But especially if it's something in sports, sports fans. They're fanatics, just like the, mm-hmm. the thing, right? We're fanatics about our team. Yeah. We are most, if you're, like, I'm a diehard Ravens fan, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't miss a game. Mm-hmm. I know just about every player on the team. I know exactly what's going on. And when it comes to something like that, if you're having a charity, whether it's for whatever athlete, to see something like that, and it's so unique, be like, okay, she's using a football. And, you know, it's like, all right. That's something that you don't ever see. Yeah. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> Thank you. You know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe People just me. do a double take it's, for it's, sure when they know, see it happening. They're like, wait, like, what? That's not a paintbrush. That's, that's right. And it's yeah. so unique and it's so different that for what you're using. That's why like, I, it's just like I'm like, dude, I was like, because you don't see that. Well, believe it or not, it really wasn't up until the sup- until Super Bowl LIV when I started to work more with the equipment. I wasn't doing it full force after okay. that event in 2015. Yeah, okay, gotcha. I was pushing my my live painting business, but I was doing it with brushes and okay. I was playing it safe. Ah. So they weren't. So you know, there wasn't really the reason to knock <laughs> down my door because I was doing it differently ah, necessarily. Okay, gotcha, so gotcha. I thought it was from 2015 or whenever you started using the tennis yes, balls, you started using that. I started to like experiment more with it and doing more like of the abstraction, ah, okay. but I hadn't really put the pieces together up until the Super Bowl. Okay, it was gotcha. in our backyard ah. and. That was uh, the 49ers Chiefs. Yep. And um, I, let's see, I was painting live during... you were doing Mahomes, weren't you? Yep. I did. Well, I didn't do the Mahomes piece then, yeah, okay. but that Mahomes piece uh, that I did okay. is one of my favorites. I didn't actually... I did a Mahomes the following Super Bowl with him facing off Brady uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, used two footballs during that event. All so right. that, That's cool. And that was a really... That was probably... That was also a great just a way to capture fans attention and to Cause, so that so this is more recent that you really started using all this all the equipment all yes. the equipment and mm-hmm. stuff because that's when I was like dude I was like putting it out there I would more. totally pay what all right you want tinker and go you know what I mean like, you know what to like I was not big on social media really prior mm-hmm. to like a couple of years ago I 
I struggled to put myself out there. I overthought everything. I didn't even do time-lapse videos. I never wanted a camera on me. So it wasn't really until I started to start you know, started putting the sports stuff out there, like the way mm -hmm. I was creating it with the equipment, that I started to gain the confidence that it was being received well. And that's an interesting thing about like art and something some artists get over maybe maybe more easily today because social media is such a huge part of yeah. our lives. Yeah. But when I grew up, it wasn't mm -hmm. really like it became a thing, you know, more recently. Right. And, and, you know, for for those of us who are like at least in our late 30s or whatever, like mid to late, like it's, you know, you have to kind of adapt with the times. So for me, it was really a blessing in disguise because the more I put it out there, the more well it was received. And then the more feedback I got, the more I got to hone my craft and and really work with the equipment in a bigger way and create partnerships and relationships just through that. So and it's amazing what social media and we were just talking about that. So the last guest I had in before you came in, country music singer. Mm -hmm. And the thing was is like it's incredible now, even in, in so many genres, right? Whether it's, you know, art or whether it's music or whether it's mm -hmm. podcasts, social media and just the internet itself, right, has allowed so many people to go on and do things that they never thought were possible. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you can be your own music group and do your own production without having some big, you know, music house having to put you out there. Isn't that amazing? You know, and wow. same thing with podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. Who would have thought, you know, 10 years ago or whatever it was that you can now all of a sudden be out on all these different platforms for all these different podcasts mm -hmm. um, and do something like this. And yes. before this wasn't happening, this was the news or people just didn't do this, exactly. right? And exactly. And so like, that's the thing, the power of what is happening. And, you know, and even in my other business that I do, I try to tell people, I was like, if you don't understand social media and you're not a part of social media, you're going to get left behind. It's and so I hate true. to say it, but you need it in your business mm -hmm. and you need to show people who you are, what you do. And um, because it's, it's huge, it's a huge thing out there. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and it's, it's as much as sometimes I hate it, <laughs> yes. you know, I understand it because mm -hmm. of what it does and I understand what it does for either the podcast or people with your skills or the artist or right. I mean, people can all of a sudden now go on a TikTok and create a music video and be famous exactly. and, uh, and they just blow up because of one and that would never have found them otherwise. Right. right? So, you know, and it could be faster on a TikTok than going on to uh, the, the, the um, game show or whatever that I forget. Um, what's that called? The one where they all compete. Um, America's Got Talent, America's something got, like that. Yeah, America's Got Talent, right? Yeah. You know, and it's time to perform, right? But yeah. like, you know, now you can just put your music out there and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So like, and I think that's the thing, because like, and I want to talk to you also because how we actually got to meet each other and know each mm -hmm. other is you would call me actually Lisa, mm -hmm. right? Lisa is the, like Lisa, um, Mitchell. Mitchell. Yeah. yeah, right. So she had actually got, we got in contact because you're a part of an organization that I didn't even realize didn't have this, but like, because you want to do a podcast yes. for this organization. So tell us a little bit about this charity Absolutely. organization yeah, so that you work for. I am on the board of directors for the Women's Sports Museum. And when I got involved with them initially, uh, 2019, I was painting live at their event, but I found them in the newspaper <laughs> and wrote to them and said, there's a woman's sports museum in Sarasota. Like I had no idea. And then, I mean, I was Googling it, but I was like, oh, they don't physically have a museum yet, like in a building. Right. But just the idea that it was being grown in our backyard here got me so excited. I was, and growing up an athlete and a girl who loves sports, <laughs> Uh, you know, we always say like the athlete's mindset is what drives you so far in life. It helps you overcome, you know, setbacks. It creates such, they're, they're just so, it gives you such a strong mentality in addition to, you know, feeling like, you know, working with others and, and really well, developing team, a sense of teamwork, teamwork and, and the camaraderie. Exactly. And, yeah. There's so many lessons that come from playing sports, especially just the ability to push yourself. So, you know, so many women and men, no matter 
what age they are. If you played sports, like you, you can relate to that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get on board with them and, or just, you know, support their organization. And I painted live at their event. Then, you know, with 2020, they kind of, you know, shifted a little bit, had to put some things on pause. And then one of the board members had reached out to me and told me they were, they had a spot opening on the board. And I, I, I applied for it and said I would really love to join this organization from the inside out and, and you know, help it grow in any way that I can and pitch to them creating, you know, a podcast, which was something they'd thought about in years past but hadn't really jumped on. So I kind of started to put the wheels in motion and got my list of contacts together. And we are right now in the beginning phases of launching that. And that was what brought Did us together. So I was yet? so excited. Game Changers. Game Changers. The official like podcast yes. of the Women's Sports Museum. And we had our first interview today. So it was Sweet. even so exciting. Yes. So now are you hosting the whole thing or is it you and yes. somebody else? Or? It's most likely going to be co-hosted um, depending on scheduling because we're really just trying to be as flexible as we can to the athletes and, you know, other um, women that we have and, or men that we have on the show because it's not really just women. I mean, it's we want to showcase people on both sides of the sideline. So mm -hmm. women who are physically in the game who've broken barriers or who are athletes themselves and then women who've also excelled whether it's reporting you know on the sidelines reporting right. in business as agents you know in the phil in in the world of philanthropy um so or at least as in have you know represented right. athletes and and their charitable causes there are so many women in in the game of sport period so we want to be able to inspire uh girls and people of all ages to pursue their dreams in sports, whatever that may be, you know, in whatever career path that may be. And that's what we're aiming for. And then tell, maybe I miss, maybe I misunderstood, but there's not another woman's museum, right? Sports museum? Not dedicated. Yeah. There is no museum in the world dedicated solely to Because I thought you sports. told me that. And I was like, yeah. well, I was like, that just seems so wild that Doesn't there's nothing it? like that. Right. Like at this day and age, you'd think something would have been started, but. Right. I'm like, how does that not happen? Exactly. So we are going to really try to make that happen. There's a Women's Sports Foundation okay. and they are, um, you know, they're an amazing organization. They've got a ton of athlete support. They focus a lot on equity and grants, um, you know, for girls and creating opportunities. And you guys for got a lot sports. of stuff now, right? You have a lot of stuff like memorabilia and stuff. We now? do have memorabilia, and um, you know, the plans were in motion in 2019 to really try to push this brick and mortar. And our architectural plans were drawn up. Uh, space had been allocated, and you know, with 2020, all, all that was placed on hold and, you know, kind of we're in a place of restructuring. Our um, capital funding campaign probably won't be taking place for that for a few more years. So right now we're focusing on the podcast and then other programs that we can push locally and nationally to try to really garner support and you just need to and find yourself some thing. really big name women athlete and oh, yeah, just we'll get, get, there. Get, get those <laughs> donations. Cause, we'll get there. Uh, so, you know, I mean. But you know what? Even just a little bit from everybody, everybody goes a long right. way. But what we do need is that face of the organization. And that's what we're looking for. Someone who wants to really take this cause and champion it. And that is one thing that will help us open doors tremendously. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's a I, again. I can't believe there's nothing out there. And I was like, you know, exactly. and it's just it's just kind of it's mind boggling, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I think it's a great thing, and that's how we got Thank talking. You. Yeah. And then you know, and I was like, because I mean, you know, you wanted to start something that I think it probably is a great thing to talk about and a great thing to bring together. Um, I think um, you know my wife Debbie, yes. and she's now a. Um, a bodybuilding pro and so she you know and 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 we go through things too because you know you know a lot of here there's i'm just sort of like a breaking a barrier and we see it sometimes because of how you know she's she's a strong woman <laughs> i mean and she gets comments all the time about her muscles and stuff like that and they're not really? always good and really? so yeah well sometimes you get it's not that they don't say anything but right. you can tell right. you get the looks yeah yeah be like 
you know, and it's like, you know, and so, um, because she is muscular and, and, you know, and I mean, but she gets a lot of people also be like, good Lord, look at those muscles. Or, you know, I wish I had muscles like that Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, you know, tough skin, right? Yeah. So, you know, and so like, and, um, it's tough and it's tough because I've seen and watched it. Um, you know, and it's like, you know, it's a different, it's a different world, but it's something that she loves and she's very passionate about. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I think, a lot of times, you know, and it's changing, but you do still have a very old school mantra where people think that sports are a men's, you know, it's it's a men's sport, it's mm-hmm. a men's sport, right? It's Body not, it's, you know, and so like, and and there's, I mean, and this is a perfect example of, you know, there's a lot of tremendous women athlete out there and we don't have anything to support that exactly <laughs> i was exactly. like exactly i was like so it's it you know living with somebody who's like that mm-hmm. and just to think about like you know how do you just, you know there's no nothing for a venus williams or you know this the williams right. sisters themselves right you know a or place something where people can go i right. mean like you know there are individual museums for like tennis and right, they get exactly. that kind of stuff but like there's nothing like out there that gives you a you know that kind of right the history, history of, of women's sports. sports and there's right. so many ways that you can take that right. i mean from you know, how did we even get started playing this game? What, like, how the uniforms have evolved from what women were allowed to wear, you know, right. back in the day versus being able to wear whatever you want, you know, within reason <laughs> right. on the courts or, you know, right. like, let's say, unless it's a team sport, of course, but, um, or even just coming to play like beach volleyball and what those women were wearing are wearing now would not be wearing those uniforms in the 1920s and 30s for sure yeah i mean the history of it or you know that kind of thing so it's just it's kind of like again it's just kind of strange um Mm -hmm. and you know and i'm sure like you know the basketball people yeah but there's no like just central place of of it all exactly and we want to build that for for you know, for the youth really to come in and be inspired and to see, because that's when, you know, you are experiencing the role that sports plays in your life. And it's, it starts with your family or whoever is introducing you to it, you know, your coaches and just being able to give them that opportunity to dream and to see like the evolution of what has happened in women's sports too is you know, it's really powerful yeah. and it and it's necessary, you know, so that's what, you know, that's what we're really trying to put together here. Well, keep me posted. I'd love to be part of it and help. If Thank you, Chris. Way, so. Absolutely. Oh, and my so, God. Yeah. I'm going to have to talk to Debbie, too, of course. <laughs> well, no, I yeah. think you should drag her in. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, you know, but no. Uh, so so what's next? So, like, as far as let's go back to you um, mm-hmm. and your paintings. Um, what's what's the next thing? So, like, is there like. Um, you know, is, do you think that you ever have like a, a like your own private section in a museum? I mean, what's your what's your goals? What's your dreams? Oh, that's so interesting. Great question. Hmm. I mean, I do have events that like bucket list events that I want to be able to paint at, and uh, relationships that I want to still cultivate, like directly within the NFL. Hopefully, <laughs> God would yeah. keep doing Super Bowl events that I love to do because the energy is so high there. Right. And that's really in the sweet spot of a lot of my work with the footballs. Um, and then really just to continue making a bigger impact with the charities that I that I do work with. And even though I've, I've scaled back a little bit in terms of the live painting, not only from having a baby, but um, but also because a lot of my time is now pushing this the Women's Sports Museum forward and, and this podcast, which as you know, it can be <laughs> oh. is time consuming mm-hmm. and exciting altogether. So so that's really what's on the horizon for me right now. Now can let's say I wanted a painting. Mm-hmm. Could somebody reach out to you and would you do you Absolutely. paint stuff for yes. people? Yes. I take commissions all the time, <laughs> whether it's pet portraits, murals or oh, really? or athletes or family portraits. Yeah, I get all sorts of requests. I don't showcase everything online that I do, but whenever somebody wants something specific, I can always show them examples that I've done in the past too. So because I was wondering about that. I didn't know if you did personal requests or that kind of thing, too. Oh, yeah. I figure you're too big time now. <laughs> no, no, it's so much fun. You know, it's like they're always like, you know, I used to travel a lot more for live painting than I did. And then 2020 rolled around and events either went virtual or that was also when I started to 
sort of scale my work more with with fanatics and um it gave me the opportunity to just to work in the studio more and and really hone my craft which is great and take in those private commissions and that's that's awesome a large part of what i do too that's awesome yeah and i think we got another video so um i think this one is the one with austin matthews right yep <laughs> Look at the brand new hockey stick too. Yes. Is this, so is this your backyard? <laughs> oh, it was. That it was, was when we lived on the east coast, coast of Florida. Okay. Yeah. I loved working with hockey equipment. It was almost as though it naturally created an icy texture, and the look of um, skates running across a canvas. So it was like the most beautiful process, honestly, for a hockey painting. And then just the backgrounds themselves. Sometimes I feel like I love the backgrounds too much to want to paint <laughs> to over them. I'm like, I'm always like, you know what? Like for someone who loves abstraction, like I kind of want to leave this as is. <sighs> so I'm probably going to come out with an abstract series this year too, just for people who want like, you know, decorative rather than figurative art with the equipment. Because, hey, you could be a sports lover and still love... I thought that was cool when you did that. The drips? Yeah, the drips. Yeah, that always comes out well on camera. Cool. So, I mean, I mean, it's very, it's awesome work. So, Thank you I'm so excited. much, Chris. So, yeah. hopefully you can, um, we'll see more of it and as you continue to grow and then continue good luck You can help your, support our um, podcast museum. by checking out our Real Hustle awesome. gear. Thank we you have so much. I appreciate hoodies, it. Thank you for having me on today. Hats. I and more. coming out. Let Thanks. everyone know that you're a real hustler, willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. You can check us out right now on realhustle.com. And right now, we are offering all of our listeners 10% off when you use the promo code podcast at checkout. Once again, that is podcast to receive 10% off your entire order.